Hello, fellow citizens, fellow lockdownies and election knobs. The title of this talk is Elections in a Time of Contagion. And I'm Graham Orr. I'm from the law school at the University of Queensland. And as some of you may know, my shtick mostly is that I look at the law of politics with a focus on the norms and the rules by which we run elections, especially in Australia. I don't know about you, but um, I was sent home to work from home over four weeks ago, and I, I think I'm privileged as a, a sort of white collar professional to have some job security and to be able to work from home. But it really does feel as if time is standing still. And yet when I look out the window and I read the news of the world at large, it also feels as if time is hurtling forward and we're being thrust into a transformed, uncertain, unknowable future. And in times of uncertainty, old verities can seem fragile. And one of those fragile things is electoral democracy. So in the background of this talk, we've got some big picture issues. First of which is just the simple question of governance at a time of emergency declarations. So governance by executive fiat, by a national cabinet, quote unquote, that's really like a council of Australian governments on speed, with parliament suspended. And when they're not suspended, they're meeting with skeleton staff and MPs, often to rush through legislation, granting further power to the executive. All of this is in some sense necessary, but all this leads to an accountability deficit. The question then is, if and when politics will return to a normal or a quote unquote new normal, um, what role is there for traditional oppositional politics um, and attacks and critiques at a time of crisis and people pulling together? What role is there for the media when at the moment it seems obsessed with the fear and the rapid developments of the responses to the virus? On the other hand, just in the last few days, looking around the world, um, on the one hand, you had the Sunday Times in the United Kingdom with a significant investigatory expose about alleged failings in the Johnson Conservative Administration's early response to the virus. On the other hand, you have in the United States the manifestation of some Trumpian protests, street protests, uh, against lockdowns. So in some liberal democracies, more than others, um, already I think we can see some politics returning to normal. On the other hand, as we'll see, there's also examples of elections where very significant benefits and swings to incumbents. The other big picture question, I guess, is the outcomes for electoral politics down the track. So we already have concerns about the potential the radicalization of authoritarian nationalism, which has been an issue around the West and elsewhere for several years now, but you only have to look at the sparring between Donald Trump and China at the moment to see where that might be heading, particularly in the wake of economic crises, uh, lockdowns and declines in world trade. On the other hand, there's plenty of optimists around humanitarians who think that if nothing else, the virus will remind us that we are all equally vulnerable, at least as physical human beings, even if the impact of the virus is clearly greater on poorer communities and nations than others. You also have people on the left of politics um, of a collectivist bent who are foreseeing the possibility of a return to social democracy in the West, potentially to democratic socialism if there's a continuation of a focus on guaranteed universal basic incomes and concerns about equal security and access to health. Compared to that, you've already got discussion in Australia in some business uh, and governmental circles about whether the to get out of debt sometime in the next year or two, 
whether there might be moves towards deregulation of industrial relations and, uh, and uh, surfing through further tax reforms um, in a neoliberal economic sense. Finally, there are probably some places overseas where governments of national unity will be formed um, and where liberalism, despite all its fragilities, will be propped up by centrist governments of national unity and also where technocratic forms of governance will be more rather than less in fashion, um, built on the back of things we're currently living through at the moment, such as massive discretions being given to science and health advisors, for example, to promulgate directions to keep people at home. All of this, of course, is unknowable. All of this is in the background. But my talk for today is going to be far more about concrete issues to do with the law and the pragmatics of running elections in a time of contagion. This talk is under the umbrella of the Electoral Research Regulation Network, but it really is riffing off an essay or commentary of two and a half thousand words that I published in early April, first appeared on the Oz Pub Law blog. That's nothing to do with the pubs that are sadly shut at the moment. It's the Australian Public Law blog hosted by the UNSW Law School. This essay of mine was also reprinted or a variation of it appeared on the wonderful Inside Story Current Affairs website. I mentioned that so you can go and read um, some of the more detail in the written version of this essay. And there's plenty of links um, in those online versions. And they were called The Demos in Pandemic, How Should We Stage Elections in a Health Emergency? So these are the titles of the different issues I'm gonna talk about uh, in this oral presentation. And thinking about the when, how and why of running elections, whether in a time of emergency or a time of normalcy, there's three big issues or themes we usually need to think about. The first and most obvious is the legitimacy of the process. Issues of integrity, security of ballots, making sure there's no intimidation of electors. Those basic kind of things that we lump under the label of free elections, and which you do very well in Australia. Then there's also issues or themes around core democratic norms, political liberty, political equality, and don't laugh, political deliberation and discourse. So they're more questing elements of our electoral system. Thirdly, and less instrumentally or concretely, there's the social experience of elections. I've written a whole book about elections and their regulation, thinking about elections as rituals and their rhythms. Elections are these massive seasonal events every three or four years. They're the one way in which a secular society not only comes together as a political entity, but sees itself as coming together physically, especially on polling day. All of these three themes, security and integrity and legitimacy of elections as aggregations of votes, the democratic aspects of political liberty, equality and deliberation, and then the whole social experience and meaning of elections as rituals. All of these three themes are challenged by the kinds of exigencies, lockdowns and physical distancing that we are necessarily having to do during a time of contagion. I mention them because whilst when we're shaping elections through joint standing committees on electoral matters and reasonably slowly or non-hastily deliberated processes, we sometimes forget some of these aspects, such as the ritual aspect. Ever more are we likely to sometimes forget those core basic themes if we're having to do things in a panic and a hurry to keep electoral democracy 
alive in a pandemic. Now, there's a nice quote there that's been bandied around quite a bit lately from the poet W.B. Yeats. All is changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Now, Yeats wrote that line in his poem, Easter 1916. He was reflecting on what was going to happen after the uprising in Dublin that led to the War of Independence in which Southern Ireland was able to separate from the rest of the United Kingdom. Now, we don't really know, but hopefully things will return relatively quickly, at least in the next year or so, to something approaching a new normal. But there's no doubt, as I said, that the kinds of bans on gathering and physical distancing which governments around the world are flagging are going to be necessary until there's a vaccine, are profoundly challenging to both the idea of elections as these huge social events and the nuts and bolts of elections as logistical events. After all, elections are the biggest peacetime logistical events that most countries go through. In a way, they're comparable, although perhaps easier to run than the Olympics, which have had to be called off in Japan or postponed. Now, when we think about the law and practicalities of electoral democracy in Australia, we have to think of the outside of the onion, the constitutional context. So we're kind of lucky that we had an election last May 2019, and that we didn't have four-year terms in Australia, because if we were coming up to a national election in Australia, in May or the middle of this year, we would be facing a huge national challenge, given the current lockdowns and limitations. So in Australia, at the Commonwealth constitutional level, we have not a fixed term, but we certainly have a maximum three-year term. We're fortunate that this virus has hit early in our cycle. That's not the case at state level. And I've given you an illustration there of the Queensland Constitution. While state constitutions are generally flexible, most states have locked in fixed four-year terms. Queensland is the last one to get on board. Under the Queensland Constitution, without another referendum, that fixed term cannot be extended. And of course, it would be perverse to have a referendum to extend the term to avoid having an election. It would be one vote to have another. All the Queensland Constitution allows is that polling day can be postponed by 35 days in case of a natural disaster, which would include um, significant transmission of the virus. And even then, the leader of the opposition has to agree to it. So there doesn't seem to be any room in Queensland to change the election date, but there is some wriggle room to delay polling in parts of the state, more likely the whole of the state, from the fixed date in late October. Hopefully, because I'm sitting in Brisbane at the moment, things will be um, more feasible and the election will be able to go ahead, albeit probably with um, a greater mixture of voting avenues than in normal circumstances. Outside power to postpone po polling itself there are levels of government in which there's much greater flexibility. Most obviously in local government, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but also it turns out for the two mainland territories. And that's handy because both the ACT and the Northern Territory are due to have their legislative elections this year. The Northern Territory on 22 August and the ACT 
on 17 October. Now, both those dates, and August isn't that far away, are fixed in statutory law, but they're weekly fixed. So the Australian Capital Territory Legislature could meet to undo its election date, or it could pass some legislation to give uh, the Chief Minister and the Ministers in consultation with the Opposition Leader the power to postpone the date and to continue with the existing members. Alternatively, the Commonwealth Parliament can rejig the Northern Territory's electoral cycle to provide flexibility if that's needed for this August. But again, hopefully the Northern Territory will continue having currently um, no new cases for some time. That's not the case with Queensland, which is locked into its election cycle and only has limited potential to postpone for 35 days. When it comes to local government, well, local government is not entrenched in the constitutions, or at least their electoral cycles are not entrenched in constitutions. That's sometimes to the chagrin of supporters of local government, but here it's actually a good thing. So, for example, New South Wales decided some weeks ago, the New South Wales government decided to postpone the New South Wales local government elections from this coming September to a year hence. What they've done is they have extended the terms of existing mayors and councillors by year, five year terms, and hopefully elections will go ahead next year as normal and those mayors and councillors will get a truncated three year term. In contrast, Queensland local elections went ahead on Saturday, March the 28th. Now those elections were already in train before we started to get something that looked fearfully like exponential growth in coronavirus in Queensland. The legislature met hastily and gave the Minister for Local Government power to postpone, suspend the elections, but that power was not used. The Chief Health Officer advised that it was probably safer to gather at polling stations, to vote on Saturday, March the 28th than it was to gather at Woolies to buy necessary food. Now this upset um, some commentators, some activist journalists, many in the community who felt that the election should be postponed. Even I thought it might've been wiser to convert the elections into postal voting for those who hadn't had a chance to vote. But the government reasoned that already there had been a very large number of people voting early, which is a continuation of a long-standing trend in Australia with convenience voting. And also there were record numbers of people applying for postal ballots, 570,000. Now, not all of them returned postal ballots. Maybe that some people, older people, were concerned about even going outside the house to post their ballots. Whatever those motivations and incentives, the turnout in Queensland at the local elections was well over 70%. And I think that's quite heroic in the circumstances. It suggests that compulsory voting laws over the years have so habituated voting that even in what turned out to be one of the lowest salience, in other words, lowest profile local elections for many, many years, close to three quarters of registered voters turned out in Queensland. The elections probably also had to go ahead, the government felt, because we had two large city councils, Ipswich and Logan, in administration, and there was a need to get them out of administration under democratically elected leadership. That said, if you think about it, what's going to happen to those 25 plus percent of voters who did not turn out? Presumably they'll receive notices to show cause why they didn't turn out. Presumably the majority of them might reply concerns about the virus. Not actual sickness, but concerns about risk. Already the Queensland Deputy Premier, Ms Trad, has signaled publicly that she wants the Electoral Commission, nudge, nudge, to waive the fine for anyone who mentions the virus. Another set of elections in Australia are due 
and they are the annual elections for a couple of members of the Tasmanian Upper House. Now, they have been postponed by ministerial fiat, and then the Tasmanian Parliament has also rubber stamped the extension of the existing members. We're only talking about a couple of seats in Tasmania in its rather unique upper house. It seems to me that was also a good move, not least because the Tasmanian upper house and a couple of its members doesn't go to the heart of the leg legitimacy of legislative government. Ditto for local governments. Now, in terms of nuts and bolts rather than timing, there's obviously a whole lot of issues that electoral commissions and others have to think about how physical limitations in gatherings and in social distancing and in hygiene will affect canvassing, particularly at polling stations, but also including difficulties with door knocking. Now, some of these impacts impact more on local elections, elections like the Tasmanian Upper House where there are strict expenditure limits, and on parties and activists that don't have a lot of money or that traditionally are relying upon face-to-face -face activism, meetings, rallies, and so on, more than candidates and parties that might rely almost exclusively on expenditure on broadcasting and social media. There's also a question of scrutinising the count. Now, at the Queensland local elections, the Electoral Commission issued a directive, effectively a directive under the guidance of the Chief Health Officer, to say that there could be no scrutineering of the election night count because of the problems of having people leaning over and breathing on the casual workers who had to social distance to count the ballots. So there's a picture there of someone able to stand outside a counting operation and look in. Now, fortunately, in a country like Australia, aside from the odd, odd blurt from Clive Palmer, we tend not to have people publicly expressing a high level of distrust or fear of electoral commissions and counts being corrupted. But that will not necessarily be the case at all times and all over the world. Third issue relating to physical limitations is potential effects on access to the ballot and differential turnout. So there was some speculation at the Queensland local elections that older people who seem to be more at risk from this virus would be particularly concerned about having to turn out on polling day. I haven't seen any statistics about a differential effect on turnout, but you can understand the logic of that. On the other hand, people might say, well, older people tend to turn out more anyway under our system compared to younger people, and this might just um, even up a skew. But if you're an individual, it doesn't mollify you to think that I was disenfranchised by concerns about health risks. It's a different argument in relation to the overall macro effects. So there's obviously a concern and need to open up even more avenues potentially for voting in Australia. The Queensland local polls, telephone voting was available, not just for those with particular disabilities, but for those who were subject to quarantine orders and required to isolate. In Australia, in the last decade or so, particularly in New South Wales under the iVote system, we've had a legislatively rolled out internet voting and telephone voting system, but one that has been focused on a minority of electors, particularly those with disabilities or those outside the state or the nation. It's not entirely clear to me that something like New South Wales I vote could be quickly and easily scaled up or on sold to say the Queensland authorities if in October Queensland was facing a second wave of the pandemic. There's also the concern that any hurried rollout and magnified rollout of internet voting would risk trust in some courts of the community where there are concerns about hacking 
and the hackability and the fact that no electoral system, including an internet one, can be made perfectly safe. That leads to discussion about having all postal vote elections. And given that the Australian Bureau of Statistics was able to have a reasonably and tolerably successful marriage plebiscite or plebis survey purely by post, there are people who think that the simplest solution, if we have to have an election during a pandemic and there are significant physical risks to overcome, is to not just allow every postal, every voter to apply for a postal vote, but perhaps to turn the election into a complete postal vote. That may have some issues for those who are not familiar with the post, younger people, although I suspect in isolation, younger people are turning to online shopping and becoming more familiar with the post. That said, there probably is no more orderly public place in Australia than a polling station. And that's been the case for well over a century since we brought in the secret ballot. Elections are not particularly unruly in Australia. And the sort of scenes you saw on polling day in Queensland at the local government polls with signs restricted, with canvases uh, corralled into a small area where they could not hand out how to vote cards because of risk of transmission, but where the where electors could go and seek advice uh, and speak to activists if necessary. And where social distancing was enforced by the Electoral Commission and the rudimentary hygiene in terms of hand sanitizers were available and borrowing from the French who um, encouraged electors recently to bring their own pens. The Electoral Commission in Queensland encouraged electors to bring their own pencils if they were concerned. We didn't see um, anything other than a highly orderly process and touch wood so far three weeks out there doesn't appear to be suggestions yet that the election polling day created um, further contagion that said the number of people who turned out in polling day was well well less than the number of people who voted early or by post early voting spreading the election period out even further, contrary to some of the submissions that the parties put in to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters in the last year. Parties tended to want to truncate early voting to create a more focused campaign again and to avoid stretching their resources. During a pandemic, there'll probably be pressure to extend early voting even further. One problem with early voting is though that electoral commissions will not be able to predict exactly how many people are going to turn up at which early voting centre on which day. Many early voting centres are not at um, schools where there's significant space. They may be in offices and other buildings where queues will form on pavements. And again, social distancing becomes a challenge. Besides issues to do with the regulations and physical limitations, there's also a big question about how elections can be free and fair during a time of crisis and fear and the role that the media plays in all this. The drowning out of, for example, the local government elections was to be expected in Queensland. Local government elections at the best of time are competing for attention with national and international news. But in times of coronavirus, they're almost drowned out completely. With local newspapers on the wane as well, that created a salience problem and a problem for electors to get information. If we had voluntary voting, I very much doubt the turnout would have been more than 30 or 40%. That in turn raises questions about whether elections in a time of contagion create undue benefits for incumbents. The Brisbane City Council, which is a partisan council, whilst there were some swing back to Labor and the Greens after a landslide to the LNP four years ago, not a single ward or the mayoralty changed hands. It would seem that in the early stages of the corona outbreak in Queensland, electors 
didn't want to take the risk of jumping horses midstream. We see in New Zealand, for example, that the National Party, which in February was riding high in the polls with close to 50% support, potential of, of perhaps achieving majority government under a proportional voting system, very rare occurrence. The National Party has now been sending out signals that it wants the government to consider potentially postponing New Zealand's elections, which are due in September. Now, under New Zealand's generally flexible constitution, that could be done by supermajority of the New Zealand Legislative Assembly. But the government says they want to plough ahead. They want to believe that the coronavirus, which is well contained in New Zealand, will be not surfing a second wave later in the year, but one suspects also that the Arden government is enjoying a bounce in support, not just from people who rally around governments and the flag at a time of national crisis, but also because of their success to date. On the other hand, as the virus second and third waves roll out, and as politics gets a bit back to normal, there may be governments in different parts of Australia around the world that will have the opposite of an incumbent benefit or effect as they might get blamed for the economic downturns for the spread of the virus, even though no government has wished this on its population. Now, as we deal with the challenges of bans on gatherings and physical distancing and so on, there's a whole lot of smaller pragmatic issues that come into play. I mentioned a couple of them. Um, the non-distribution of how to vote card, which is a big challenge for activists and parties given our preferential voting systems in Australia. The question of allowing or not allowing scrutineering. The Queensland local government elections these were dealt with by the parliament, imbuing the electoral commission with regulatory discretions to issue directives, albeit directives under the wing of the chief health officer's direction. So the chief health officer could make directions specifically about the elections and then the electoral commission could make even more specific directions. All of this suggests that we're going to rely heavily on the NAUS and the competence of our legislative drafters, because obviously hasty drafting, just like hasty policy making, can lead to unintended consequences and confusions. It also, this will lead to challenges for the electoral commissions, not just facing um, some of the concerns about what is safe and what is doable and what is affordable, but also because Electoral commissions in Australia have tended to see themselves as administrators, not regulators, by which I mean electoral commissions don't like being vested with discretion to make rules because that risks politicising them. Whenever you make a rule, someone, one party or another, one group of activists or another, may feel that the rules disbenefit them. But we cannot have a situation where we rely on parliaments to be deft enough or expert enough to change the electoral law during a pandemic or a crisis like this. So the old traditions of the electoral code of the electoral acts being the detailed model that the electoral commissions almost blindly or automatically implement is gonna to have to be adjusted if we're going to deal with elections in a time of pandemic or crisis. Hopefully, and I'm reasonably certain that in Australia, given the professionalism of our electoral commissions, unlike say in the United States, this isn't gonna to lead to any significant concerns about declining trust in the process itself, but, if this crisis goes on for nine months, a year, a year and a half, and creates social dislocation, socioeconomic dislocation and disorder, there will be challenges and problems potentially for trust in governance more generally. 
Now, Australia is an island. It has helped us, our island status has helped us deal with the virus, I suspect. But we're not alone in the challenges of electoral democracy in a time of contagion. If you think about the pandemos around the world, we can see many examples of elections proceeding at this time and of elections being postponed or called off. You can find a detailed list and some discussion about what's happening internationally on the International IDEA, IDEA website. That's a non-government democracy um, organization, democracy support organization based in Sweden. To give some examples, and to start with a very picturesque one, elections for the Irish Senate went ahead as planned in March. Now, the Irish Senate is not a mass electorate. It's not directly elected. It's elected from people who represent different sectors. So there's a sectoral panel of people who vote based on the fact that they're university graduates, for representatives from the university sector, for people involved in unions, for representatives from the labor sector, agriculture, and so on. So an electorate of 100,000 or so rather than many millions. Also traditionally it's done by post. So again, there weren't such concerns about physical distancing. However, there were concerns about scrutinizing the process, the same concerns we had in Queensland. What they did in Ireland was they had live feeds broadcast on the internet all day long of the count. And this allowed soporifically people to go to the website and literally physically witness something that most people outside scrutineers would never witness. That is the long, slow, steady process of the count. So there's one little idea that the Irish developed in response to the need to at least have the appearance of openness in relation to counting paper ballots. Picture there on your top left is from a polling station in South Korea. Now South Korea, it's well known, they've had a remarkable relative success in containing the virus, but they are facing a potential second wave of the virus, and yet they went ahead with largely in-person elections recently. The result of the elections was a landslide to the existing government. And again, you can see reasons for that. People wouldn't want to change a horse midstream, but also because people in South Korea would see the relative success of what their government has achieved. Now, South Korea is, like Australia, a robust liberal democracy. It's also a highly resourced society. Compare that to the African country of Mali that went ahead with its two-round election, Mali having had a French a colonial history. So we have preferential voting. They have a two-round system. The Malian elections had already been delayed for long period of time because of civil unrest and violence in the country. The elections in a sense had to go ahead because there has to be a process to return Mali to some semblance of civil order. You see a picture there from the first round of polling, no social distancing there, not the kinds of resources we have in a more well-heeled society. Turnout was quite good on the first round, but as the virus spread has um, increased in Mali. Turnout on the second round was disappointing. The other thing that might be noted is in Mali, at least around the time of the first round of the elections, um, as much concern was expressed about continuing violence as about the coronavirus. Indeed, I think the opposition leader was uh, briefly kidnapped from the streets of Mali um, prior to the first round of voting. All of this is to say that you have to consider the context of the particular voting system as well as the resources in the society concerned. So elections in a pandemic will be different in the United States with its so-called long ballot. In November, people may turn up at polling stations and have to vote for dozens of different races in the US from the president down to the proverbial dog catcher. In Mali, places like France, Francophonic world, there's 
the challenge of holding the first and second round election. In Australia, we have the question of preferential voting and long ballot papers for some upper houses and so on. Each country will have its own different challenges. Now, New Zealand, as I mentioned, the elections are said to be going ahead and hopefully that will be the case. If we look around the world though, we saw in Indonesia, a kind of two-step where regional elections were, the national government said were to go ahead and then they were postponed at the last minute as I understand. In the United Kingdom, similar to New South Wales, their round of local elections for this year have been postponed by year. Uh, in France, uh, much to the chagrin of many in the population, their first round of voting went ahead in mid-March, but instead of the second round being held, such was the um, exponential galloping of the virus there and the death rates that the second round of their local elections were held not one week after the first round, but they've been postponed three months till late June. Perhaps the galloping elephant in the room internationally, of course, is US electoral politics, particularly in the age of Trump. Now in the United States, the primary election season has been heavily disrupted, but at least at the presidential level, the primary season is now relatively unimportant because Sanders has withdrawn Biden as the putative nominee for the Democrats and Trump was facing no real opposition in the Republican party. So in the US, all attention is now focusing forward to what might happen in November. In 1918, during the crippling Spanish flu epidemic, the US elections went ahead as normal with in-person voting. That was a time of perhaps less risk averseness and certainly perhaps a time of less scientific medical understanding of propagations of viruses. The US elections cannot be postponed without the constitution being changed. Or to correction, they can be postponed, but not beyond January. So all focus is manifesting in the US on how the elections might proceed, given they have to occur this year. And with a lot of things in the US, but particularly with electoral matters, things are highly partisanly charged. So there are some in the hierarchy of the Republican Party who are saying already that they would not countenance um, widespread postal voting, particularly all mail elections in the US. They allege that all postal ballots would be rotable. Now it's certainly true that postal voting doesn't provide the same security if you have to vote from home, if you are suborned by an overbearing spouse or father or mother, you don't have a truly secret ballot. But that's a different thing from suggesting that a postal ballot election will be subject to massive corruption of people going around stealing postal ballots and filling them in. There's relatively little evidence of electoral fraud in the United States. And so progressives and Democrats who want to maximize turnout are already turning their minds to whether at least particular states might be encouraged to extend postal voting, which in some states can be as high as 25% already as a form of absentee voting, can do what a few states already do, which is to hold all mail ballots. Besides potentially enhancing turnout, which may benefit Democrats, this would also overcome concerns in less well-resourced inner city areas in the United States that there'll be limited polling stations or that communities that may be the hardest struck by the virus will be scared of turning out in November if again, there's a second or third wave and continuing spread of the virus. So all focus in the US is on perennial questions of turnout and its partisan effects and on this ongoing debate in the US about the lack of a professional national election commission and how electoral administration is hyper federalized in the US. So it's not just in many states, 
the laws on who can vote, very state by state, even for national elections, but in the US, your practical ability to vote may depend on the resources and planning available in your local city or county. Now on that note, um, I'm gonna wind up this talk. Uh, happy to get any feedback. Um, you can Google my email address. I also want to pay some respects, a call out to Michael Maley, who is always a guru in this area of elections and their administration and some suggestions he's given me by email on um, this essay and talk. My account today of the challenges to electoral democracy in a time of contagion is at best a preliminary one. And I've rooted it in the contours of the present epidemic in Australia, assuming controllable paths of contagion and continuing social order. But around the world, contagion will be worse and better in some areas. Social order, economic collapse will be worse or better in other areas. Different contexts, different voting systems will come into play, as well as broader political considerations of trust, the role of the media, and governance generally. There's some evidence so far that incumbents, say in South Korea, all the way through the Brisbane City Council, have undue advantage in times of crisis and upheaval. Whether that will continue in the months ahead it is yet to be seen. Ultimately though, postponing elections for too long, let alone canceling them, by definition creates disenfranchisement just as there are serious challenges to the practical and psychological running of elections that may lead to disenfranchisement, not just in the US, but amongst certain classes of voters in Australia. I wanna finish with another quote, and this is from the book La Peste or the Plague by Albert Camus. Again, much cited at the moment. Camus wrote that, quote, each of us had to be content to live only for the day, alone under the vast indifference of the sky. That was the existential dilemma faced by people as individuals living with contagion and fear. But collectively, however, whilst we live under the vast indifference of the sky, we also live under the vast and far from indifferent system of government that is absolutely crucial at the moment to try and manage and plan and get us through these difficult times to an uncertain future. So electoral democracy, for all the challenges it faces, has a very significant role to play in maintaining, legitimating, bringing together society at a time when we cannot be together physically all the time.